welcome to the Children's Book Author Podcast. I'm your host, Eleanor Page. If you write for children, or it's always been your dream to, you're in the right place. As the children's book author, I'm on a quest to discover everything there is about writing, publishing, and marketing children's books, as well as how to supercharge my creativity, skyrocket my productivity, and absolutely everything else there is to know about how to be the best, so you can be too. Join me as I interview fabulous guests and become the children's book author. Welcome back to the Children's Book Author Podcast with me, Eleanor Page. I've had a lovely run of kind of almost a theme emerging on the last few episodes. We started with writing picture books, writing graphic novels, and today we're moving on to writing middle grade books with Mark Remus. Mark is a fellow self-published author and He is an incredibly supportive fellow author of mine. I've known him for many years now. He's just such a gorgeous person. He often reaches out whenever I've published a new book and says, I've bought it, I had a read, I shared it with my friends. And, you know, you don't really get that that often. And, you know, nor should you necessarily expect it that often. We're all very busy as authors We don't necessarily want to read each other's things, but he is truly somebody who's exceptionally passionate about books and books for kids. And as I said, he is so amazingly supportive and he's had such fantastic success with his middle grade books. You're going to find today's interview such a treat. Look, we did talk for a very, very, very long time. In fact, as I was editing it, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to reach out to Mark and say I need to pay you for this episode because it went for, I think, over an hour and a half. So hang in there. If you're a middle grade author yourself, you're going to love our chat because both of us being middle grade authors, we cover lots of topics from the inside. We're actually in there doing the work. We talk about your confidence as an author. We talk about editors and how important it is to have a really great one. We talk about writing series, about winning awards. Oh, so many amazing, amazing things. And Mark's got this fantastically soothing voice. So you kind of get carried away and could talk to him all day. Likewise, you can listen to him all day too. There is a little bit of buzzing at times on Mark's audio and you know, that can't be helped because he, I think, was logged in from Germany, me in Australia. We did have to change platform at one point. So we had a few challenges with the technology. We lost each other a few times. We persisted through. So do hang in there through some of that buzzing or that little bit of glitches sometimes when he talks, because what he has to say is absolute gold. I want to do a shout out for those people, authors, writers who wrote to me about that very interesting quote that I gave a few weeks ago and I left it to your discretion. I'll repeat it now. You will assume a more aggressive role in life and bring your competition to their knees as well as remove people who have been working behind the scenes against you. (laughs) Well, in this episode with Mark, I think I finish off by, we're talking about awards and I finish off by saying that my approach is to enter awards when the good writers aren't entering or when I've killed them off. You can tell I'm a writer because I'm aggressive and killing people off, but it's just part of the fun. But to those of you who wrote to me, it was just great. It was great to receive all your feedback about how you took that statement. A few of you were saying in regards to yourself, um, removing some people who you feel have been not necessarily the right people to hang around with. A few others, which I loved, said being aggressive can be seen as such a negative thing, but actually being aggressive means you're very passionate and you you know want to be up there with JK Rowling, who's your competition, and that's a really healthy way to think of competition. 
And a few of you also talked about it referring to yourself. So I think I had about 10 or 11 of you, which was gorgeous. I love this. Thank you so much for writing in to the podcast. I always love to hear from you. And then I know I'm not just talking to myself into a microphone and nobody out there is listening. Or, of course, you think I'm a big doofus. Do you use that word, doofus? It's one of my favorite 80s and 90s words. And, you know, you got to be a doofus when you're a children's book author. At least that's part of my brand. You do your brand. Well, enjoy today's interview with Mark. He's going to really raise the bar on you. And if you're like me, you're going to leave the interview feeling super encouraged, feeling that Instead of feeling sorry for yourself for not having a big, powerful trad publisher who's pouring millions of dollars into you to make your book the best that you can make it, after listening to Mark, I think you're going to be motivated to work to make your book the best that it can be, even if you're publishing it yourself. Because he is a gun. He's an artist. He's a writer. He's learning new things all the time. He knows my goodness, I don't know, I'm going to, he doesn't, but I'm going to say he knows every language that exists. He knows a lot of languages. He's just incredible. He works and works to educate himself and to become the best that he can be. And you're going to love it. So put aside an hour and a half, get a lovely cup of something hot or cold, depending where you are in the world, and enjoy today's episode with Mark Remus. Welcome back to the Children's Book Author Podcast with me, your ghost, your ghost, goodness, I am not your ghost, I am your host, Eleanor Page. And today I am joined by, ooh, what adjective am I going to use? Today I'm going to say I'm joined by creative guru, Mark Remus, who is an award-winning novelist of middle grade and young adult and the most incredible artist you've ever seen in your entire life. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here today. What? I'm just closing my outlook because it went bing, which hopefully nobody heard. Welcome to the show. It is amazing to have you on. I'm going to start in the most strangest place because the people who are listening will not be able to see this, but you have the most exciting props behind you. <laughs> And it's yes. the weirdest place to start an interview. But tell me about your props, Mark. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I I made a book dummy basically of my book, The Chocolate Clouds, and this is the one the one the people who can see it uh, notice where I'm pointing at. So it is a huge oversize um, image of the book basically that I built, and you can actually open it. I use it for readings so that I can like open it up. And then have my manuscript in there to the kids then. So it, it's kind of interesting to, for the kids to have a huge book <laughs> in front of you, you know. So, um, and next to it over here, you see, oops, let me see if I can point at her. There she is. She's one of the main characters in, in the Chocolate Clouds. She's a carrot, uh, a, a lady carrot, actually. And... Um, yeah, I built her out of clay and then painted her, and so you you get like a 3D version of her. <laughs> and then all my books, of course. Let's see if I can roll to the side so you can see it. Here are all the books, you know, that I wrote, and these are the ones that are, have been translated. All the translations. We're probably going to talk about this later. And uh, and here you see a huge giant chocolate. This is only part of it. It reaches further it's like um almost one and a half meters high so so i made it out of paper mache and in the background yes some more chocolates <laughs> so these are the props you are amazing so nice. creative that's why you're my creative <laughs> guru i'm going to pick Thank your brain you. about everything sure. today i cannot sure. wait but first how did you make the giant book that is so clever it, that you can take in a giant book to show just, kids. I love it. I just made it out of cardboard. So if you have a book box, you just take a regular thin box, you know, and then you put like a, a cover on top of it, and then you got your book already. <laughs> I can show you more de show it to you in more detail here. You see it has like the pages here, there. 
Oh my goodness. And then gorgeous. when you open it up, it's empty, of course, but I have my <gasps> manuscript in there. Oh, it's so cool. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love this. All Oops. right. L let's start at the beginning. Yes. Were you an artist? before you were a writer or yes. were you a writer before you became an artist? No. Tell me about yes. your journey yes. in your creative okay. guruness. Yes. I was always a painter. I, I painted already when I was a child. Um, I studied um, art and illustrations in California. So um, I've always been a painter. I was, when I was younger in school, I was not good at writing. <laughs> I was. Um, I was not reading much, I would say, you know, compared to most authors who always tell me, um, oh, I was reading a lot as a child. I did not. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was learning about this much later. But um, it was in college when I started um, illustrating um, covers and, and, and um, illustrations for books that my teacher, she said, well, why don't you write some stories? that go with the illustrations for a change. I was like, okay, I can try that. So, um, so I started writing a story and she loved it a lot. And she said like, oh, wow. Uh, usually most painters, I wouldn't recommend that they write their own stories. They can't write. Just like you have the opposite. Many authors, you know, I would not recommend you do your own covers, you know. <laughs> um, and that was the same. Uh, but she said, oh, wow, your stories are interesting, you know. Why don't you illustrate a whole book? So I illustrated a paper book. Now looking back at that book, it's horrible, I find. She liked it, <laughs> but uh, it didn't meet any standards, um, international standards or that would be published nowadays. But um, at the time, I was really excited about it, and I start writing more. And I started developing a whole series called uh, Magora now. It started with a little, uh, little um, story, and it developed into a six-book series. And over the years, I just then started taking classes in children's book literature. I started working with edges and so on, so on, so on. And then after many years, I started writing in the 90s that series. And it was not until 2006, 2016 that I published the first book of that series so this is basically the journey <laughs> amazing and i heard the word in there standards yes <laughs> they've got to be a certain standard yes. which is very typical of all your work that's mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. you are an award-winning author mm -hmm. and it's not like just one of your books mm -hmm. has won awards like i think they all have they are, yeah. is that right yeah. they probably most of them have yes yes multiple yes, awards. Yeah, yes all of them except of the last three in the series because you cannot enter book into from a series of like the fifth book into a competition without understanding the first three ones but the other ones yes they all did yeah so how did you get to writing at such a standard? And how do you know when you've reached that standard? This has always to do with your editors. You know, that's why I always re recommend work with editors. You learn so much from them, you know. And um, over time, of course, the editors change. But... Um, Start with one at least, you know, the one that has a certain standard who has work in the in the in the industry. Because when they edit your book, they will uh, recommend, you know, look at this. Why doesn't this work, and so on. So this really helps um, to understand what the standards are. Um, a lot of people are like, you know, oh, I don't care about the standards. You know, there are authors who say, oh, no, no, I do it the, the way I want. Um, also from editors they say like oh yeah they fight for their stories and everything and so on but it doesn't work you know of course you can do this nowadays and publish it but you're not going to have that success that you want you know? so i recommend stick to um first of all stick to editors that are known and that are good um because anybody can call himself an editor these days so um definitely stick to one who is well known or someone who has uh, extensive experience 
and then work with this and really listen to the recommendation these editors do and remember them next time you write the book so you don't make that same mistake again. Hmm. Right. So where did you find your first editor? I what would, sort of tests yeah. do you put them through to know that they're good ones? I was I was uh, first taking classes. I was taking at the Institute of Children's Literature. I was taking three years of classes so that I learned the, the standards already. And in that course, I got to know some of the editors. So, um, so I started working with uh, some of these editors first, and then later on, I um, I found one who I really liked and I worked well with for many years. I worked with her then for fifteen years, and until last year, and uh, she still edited the Chocolate Clouds. She was that was the last book she edited, and then last year she had a fatal accident, unfortunately, and she passed away. Oh. Yeah. So it was a big shock for me last year. And no, yeah, yeah, it was the beginning of last year, yes. So it was a big shock, but um, I didn't know what to do at first because I, I knew everything that she had taught me. So it was already kind of a routine with her. Um, but it was no, no longer that um, there was something that was completely incorrect when I submitted to her because I learned for 15 years from her, you know, so it was mo mainly like little things that she picked on, you know, so, um, so I decided, well, I have to find a new editor. And I was really lucky to find a really good editor one step up from the one that I have. And I found Jennifer Reese, who is the editor of The Hunger Games, a really famous um, series that came out on TV also. Um, and, and she kind of like pushed everything to another level. It was really amazing because she, um, did a, a conceptual editing, uh, first and she went into the details. I actually, on my new book, this is not about the chocolate clouds on the new book. I actually had to add new characters, uh, because she recommended that. And it was at first I was like, Oh my God, it's a lot of work to add it to to create new characters and many authors would say no 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 i'm not doing this you know but i mean with an editor like that who is so well known i mean she knows what she's doing so i decided okay i'll gonna dig in and i created a new character then and it came out for the better and now the book is is in the last stages of being edited by her now copy editing only and I think it's going to come out really great because of her. So I'm really happy that I found her. It's still, I lost my, my old editor, but in a way for my career, it really helped a lot because it improved uh, the writing. Yeah, incredible. A tragic loss of, of your editor, you know, and I imagine to the literary world in general, though hopefully she is guiding so us too, from yeah. above in the writing mm -hmm. process. You know, I always like to think of editors having little book <laughs> wings, you know, sort of flying about and uh, <laughs> and influencing the next generation yes. of, of writers. But, yeah, I can imagine mm -hmm. it's a terrible loss both personally, your relationship mm -hmm. and knowing yes. You know, you, it sounds like you yes, built quite yes, a strong yes. bond with her. And then, you know, on the flip side of that, from a you know more, mm -hmm. more yes. self-centered point of view, the kind of oh, exactly. who do I now trust mm -hmm. to look after my mm -hmm. book, yes. babies, you know. Um, but, but it's incredible to me that uh, that relationship that you mm -hmm. build mm -hmm. with your editor, like is that uh, – so it's definitely also yes. developmental. Yes. It isn't just the line yes. – editing they actually yes. are guiding yes. you to yes write definitely better. i mean it develops over the years it developed uh, into a friendship this is the same as happening with jennifer right now uh you need to have a connection you know really understand the other person to really uh, make the book better um it develops over the time over time and um you need to have this i i think kind of like relaxed feeling towards uh, your editor and the editor towards the author so that you feel you're offended that you feel you're offending someone all the time a lot of authors are being uh, first time authors are being offended when they're being told by their editor oh you have to change this or this or this oh no i'm not changing anything about my story they are saying you know 
which is, of course, I mean, you, you can do that, but it's not going to get you to, to the next level. And it certainly is not going to improve the relationship to your editor, who knows more than you do. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And a, a trad published author would not just put it in and have it be published. Yes. They get many rounds, exactly. many several. So yes. I've heard some authors say up to 20 rounds yes, of edits. Yes, yes. I was talking with Jennifer about The Hunger Games, and she said it went through many rounds and many editors even in the house because she was working for it is Harper Collins that published it. And there were like two or three. I love others. Harper Collins. Yeah. <laughs> I love Harper Collins. Every time I've seen Harper Collins at any events, <laughs> there's something about them. It's like they glow. Yeah. <laughs> if there's any Harper Collins people out there you want to be on the show? Uh, I, email I think, me. There's something about them. I don't know what it is. So that's so cool. I, I, she was there. I think Amazing. it is. Yeah, I, I think it's Harper Collins. I'm not 100 percent sure though. I, it's one of the big five, actually. So, um, yeah, so she said there we are. We love the other five, the other big ones. Yeah, too. yeah we love them all. <laughs> <laughs> Even though as, as a self-publisher, they are the competition. <laughs> so, oh, technically, but then yeah. I guess every book is kind of the competition yeah. of every other book. But yeah. having said that, they all float exactly, up together, yes, yes. don't they? But, like, um, but you have to, I mean, when looking at these big publishers, and that's what I also recommend, especially for self-published authors, Look at these big published uh, big publishers and their publications because they also give you the standards. They have dozens of people working on this. They have all these problems eliminated that a lot of books in the self publishing industry have because they have the, the they have the editors, they have the designers. So um, take that as your goal to reach. You know, rather than going like, no, I do it differently because they are always doing this kind of this, I want to fight against them. Yeah, you can fight against them, but you might go, you probably go down, you know, because um, who has re revolutionized the industry, you know, as a self-publisher in the past 20 years? Not a single person has really. The, the self-publishing industry got more closer to the standards of the traditional publishing industry. So I recommend, you know, look at those books, look at these editors, because they know what they're doing. Really sound advice. Makes me want to, like I used to lie in bed at night and be like, I need, you know, like, 50 rounds of editing myself <laughs> and, and feel kind of cheated that I didn't get it and then, you know, put out a book uh -huh. thinking, oh, I know it could be better, <laughs> but, you know, I didn't have 50 rounds right. of editing, you know. Um, but then, you know, like I don't have that sort of relationship with my uh -huh. editor, okay. if you're listening to this, sorry, editor. <laughs> but, you know, like I just send off my mm -hmm. book and she'll send back a few develop developmental mm -hmm. things but says, it's pretty good, line edits it, good to go. And I think, is it? Is it? And I, I kind of wish I had someone mm -hmm. like what you're yes, talking yeah, about, yeah. which is why I'm asking, yes, yeah. that really kind of does work with your manuscript to make it a lot, a lot better, better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. So right. this is I'm learning a lot right, from right. talking okay. to you, which okay. is really, really <laughs> valuable, very, very valuable. So how do you come up with your ideas like do you sit down and plot are you like do you come up with your characters like what's your process okay um i get that question very often <laughs> especially about how do you get the ideas um i never have problems coming up with ideas i have the problem of selecting which ideas are good and which ones are bad um because you can come up with ideas Every day, everybody can actually, you know. Um, but are these good ideas? Or are these bad ideas? That is the question, you know. And that takes a lot of time to really then write all these ideas down and then take out the ones that you don't like. You know? I usually, mm -hmm. I usually start with um, a problem uh, when I um, uh, um, start writing a book. Um, I, I take a problem and I think of what young adults or uh, kids in middle grade, uh, what issues they have and what they're dealing with. Um, because any book, especially for kids, need to have conflict and need to have uh, a problem that needs to be solved. 
Um, so like in the chocolate clouds, if we go back to that, I took the problem of the weight problem issue because a lot of kids now nowadays have weight, have weight problems, is, problem issues, just like many of the adults. Mostly this comes also from their parents. And um, so taking this issue then and then develop a story around. Um, this is how I start basically. And then I come up with a general idea which takes many months, you know, sometimes I come up and then I throw it out again and I have many things happening at the same time. Um, in the end, I pick one and even though I might like some other subjects, um, I decide then to go with the one that I find is more approachable um, for the kids, which is uh, something they can relate to. And especially then focusing on writing the story in a way that you're not preaching to them. That is very important because a lot of, a lot of authors, uh, especially a lot of mothers who write books then, they tend to, you know, true. go up. <laughs> We're and guilty of this, exactly, I know. Exactly, <laughs> go up and say, don't do this, kitty, you know, and then... <laughs> These kids are smarter than you think, you know, they understand it. They go like, okay, mom says no, then I'll do it, you know. So write the story in a way that it is um, just a story. They can figure out the meaning behind it themselves. And as long as you're not saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, then they'll figure it out themselves. And with the chocolate clouds, I combined it basically, a whole world of food and not telling them, you know, don't eat chocolates, don't eat sweets. No, actually, at the end, I'm saying also, you know, you can eat a little. It's just how much you eat. And, um, and that is, I think, important. That, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, really good advice. Yes, definitely, isn't it? It's us mothers. <laughs> we can't help ourselves, <laughs> for sure. Well, what makes you want to write for children in particular? Like, where, is, where does that come from? In you? I, I, well, I think children i mean that's the future of humankind so you want to have every every time when someone says we want to have a better future you know this is where you start so and you don't want to have in the future a whole generation of kids having major problem with weight being overweight um fighting that and everything um experienced it through my family and um, my one of my best friends, uh, Sandy, in high school, she was at the time already pretty heavy. Uh, she was at, at the age of 16. Uh, we lost contact then after a while. And because at the time there was no internet, oh, for like 20, 30 years, we didn't have contact until we finally found each other again through the internet. Um, she had gotten so heavy. Um, she was obese, basically, and she couldn't get out of bed anymore. She she was so uh, overweight, and uh, at the time, the doctor said, you don't have much longer to live. And so she decided she's going to change her whole diet and everything. And she did, and she lost all the weight that she could finally get out of bed again and walk and everything, and she was really happy about it. And she wanted to write a book um, um, to, t uh, to tell, basically, adults how to lose weight, and that it's important to do that. And we were talking about this a lot and while I was writing The Chocolate Clouds because I, I basically thought it's more important to tell this to kids than to the adults because adults are more reluctant to accept something new or to change something. So kids are, more, are the ones that you should address, I think. And, um, and what happened then, unfortunately, is she was trying to... Um, to tell her kids who were also already overweight, they didn't listen, of course, because she was doing the, you know, the <laughs> I'm telling you, the the mother thing, kind of like don't do this, and of course they didn't, they didn't do that. And um, unfortunately, three years later, while the book was still in production, she passed away from cancer. So, so she never saw the chocolate clouds being published um i i yeah i wrote a dedication to her in the back of the book uh to remember her and so i hope i hope her 
wish comes through. You know, she didn't get to write her book, but I hope the wish comes through through the chocolate clouds that the kids will realize that maybe eating some vegetables or some fruits and in, in, in change of like chocolate all the time might be good. You know. How beautiful that you put a, a dedication to your friend Sandy in the book. And it's, um yeah, it's funny the way you say it's mothers, we say don't do that, don't do that. Um, and I hear yeah. that from all my guests, you know, don't mm-hmm. make it too lesson-y, too in your face. Right. So, you know, we it's need hard. to take, I know, we need to take this on board. <laughs> and, um, I mean, there are, I was saying to someone I interviewed actually that, there are actually a lot of picture books that now can get away with that on Amazon, I've noticed. Yeah, a lot of them do that, yes, yeah. But they probably wouldn't be picked up by a traditional publisher with exactly. that sort of yeah, and usually, And usually I noticed also with a lot of them, they don't sell as well as the others um, because the mothers might like it, you know, but the kids won't. So the mothers are, in the end, the ones who are buying the books, you know. So, but the question is, are the kids going to pick it up themselves? Are they going to read it themselves? Or is the mother sitting them down and reading them to them and saying, like, listen, you have to read this book. <laughs> That's uh, also that you want the kid to pick up the book uh, themselves and then really read it um, on their own, you know especially middle grade and young adult readers because, you know, that's when a lot of the kids drop off reading. So, you know, we need to entertain them essentially. And now we're competing with video games and Netflix. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So so would you describe your books as being fast-paced? Yes, definitely. I would say that. Um, All my editors always said it's like, Constantly something is happening. Yeah. And I like that because um, kids have a very short attention span. Um, I mean, some adults do too, but <laughs> um, mostly kids, it's just in the nature of it. I mean, you, you can't um, have a description of something in your book uh, over five pages describing a door or something, you know, kids will lose interest. So you constantly need to look at how the whole plot is developed. Um, and at what point you need to insert something new to keep a, a, a child from getting bored. And, uh, with adults, it's a different story. You can like write descriptions for like 10 pages. Many people will still get bored, you know, but they, uh, might continue reading, but kids will just put down the book. We'll say, no, I'm not going to read this anymore. You know? So, and that's why I think it has to be fast paced. You know, like even I love reading middle grade more than anything. I am a kid who never grew up, but having said that, I'm even finding like middle grade a bit slow <laughs> these days, <laughs> which sounds like an awful thing to say, but I'll, I'll you know, I'll get the published books and I'll be like, Oh, I don't know why I'm falling All asleep right. here. Why this is <laughs> why this is you know losing me. Uh, and I can genuinely say, uh, having read yes. many of your books up until now, that I don't have that problem with yours. <laughs> and, yes. and and this is key. Almost like I need them to uh, go even right. faster than <laughs> than some of them are actually still even going. Like move uh, a little quicker here. Make this more yeah. exciting. <laughs> is that just me, or do you think that I'm representative yeah. of children? in this day and age, because I am a big child. I, I think the way you're doing it is perfect to write children's books. So that's why your books are so great also, because um, if you have that attention span that is similar to kids sometimes, you're going to write better <laughs> for the kids. <laughs> um, well, um, this, is, this is true. And actually my novel, The Magician's Convention, which is madness uh, on a page. Yeah. I mean, that's just my palate cleanser series of write the stupidest uh-huh. thing I can come up with, right? Uh-huh. And um, it really is. I do that on purpose with that series. And yet I get a lot of reviews that say my ADHD son, who never reads a whole book, loved your book. And I'm like... Yeah. Oh, maybe I'm ADHD and don't realize. 
<laughs> so I like him yeah. that fast and crazy as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, but kids do want to have a fast pace. You can you can't have a description for 10 pages or five pages, you know. You can't also that's what I also hear very often is saying like um oh, I have a book of 10,000 uh, 100,000 words for a middle grade. No. It's not going to work because uh, middle grade are not going to read 100,000 words. Um, it might be going more into the upper middle grade, maybe 12, 13. There are some kids. There are always exceptions, you know. But the general, um, the general 8 to 12-year-old is not going to read 100,000 um, words. Uh, it has to be up to like... Uh, from 30,000 to 50,000 words, depending, you know, on if you want to hear to the lower or the upper middle class. Uh, um, great. Um, so, yes, I mean, you really have to look also. And these are, again, the standards. Uh, you have to look at that in order to also gear to what the kids want. And they don't want to have a book that is 100,000 words long because it will lose their interest. Yeah, that's that's very true. I think a lot of people base that because they'll say like, well, Harry Potter number three or whatever was, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and it's like, well, <laughs> you know, it wasn't book one, it was book three and, you know, lots exactly. of Exactly. Book three was not really geared to middle grade anymore. It was really more like a young adult book then, mm -hmm. you know, also the, the subjects and everything and it was getting thicker and thicker. Yes, it was going to more young adult and in the end it was even geared to more adults or new adults you know so a middle grade i i doubt that a middle grade eight-year-old could have easily read the sixth book you know of harry potter without having to look up words uh paying attention i think a lot of these kids ha had grown by that time the sixth one came out and they were much older already at the time you know so, yeah. Um, yeah, Harry Potter is a very different uh, issue and a different subject, I think. I'm pretty sure I had to use middle grade. I had to use a dictionary to look up certain things in Harry Potter, I must confess. Yeah, yeah. And I know, you yeah. know JK says that she likes to write up for kids. Mm -hmm. My approach yeah. is actually the exact opposite, which yeah. people may or may not like, but it's it's where I'm at. It's what I like to do. I actually like to sort of write it at a level which is mm -hmm. like really easy, plain, super yeah. easy, plain language. And it's, yes. I remember being at high school and the teacher saying to me, and, you know, this is one of my, I might have said this already in, in an interview. And if I have, I mm -hmm. apologize to the listeners, but I think I was um, maybe year eight and she said, you're the second best writer in the class because your writing's too mm -hmm. simple. And, you know, you, the story is great, but the writing is too simple. Whereas the first best writer in the class, and she reads me the sentence, and I remember this word, it burned into my brain. It was the milieu. And I thought, milieu? <laughs> what does milieu oh, mean? Geez. You know, Thank like, you. hold French on. words. <laughs> right? I'm like, that's not, that's, and I remember thinking all these years, yeah. lots and lots of years later, I'm not a very good writer. My inner, inner critic took that and would say, mm -hmm. I'm not a good writer because I write very simple. I'm not. But actually, now I see it as my strength. Like if I'm right. you know, explaining complex things to people, I tend to do it in a very down to earth, almost silly style. Yes. And, yes. and it helps people understand. And that's just where I'm at. So it's also about owning yes. yourself, isn't it? Exactly. But having said exactly. all that wonderful yes. speech, you do have a way with prose and I would like to know how you developed that you know like how did you develop the sort of pacing of when characters speak and you describe and you know how did you because no one ever talks about that we talk a lot about pacing. about plotting and characters but I remember when I sat down to write my first novel I thought okay I kind of know how to plot and okay characters whatever but how do I actually write it like does Someone speak and then someone else speaks and then is there too much speaking? And then I put a description like no one ever talks about how to lay that out and your books are done beautifully. So speak to me about how you learned how to do that. Very interesting. I never got this question before, I have to say. It's um, because I never really, when I 
think about it, I never really plan this out. It just comes natural. And I think it is the same thing that you were just describing that um, you are like talking at the level of the kids. You're talking more like on the lower level than the higher level. And I think I have that same attention span that I'm reading something and I have a description and I'm going like, wait a second, it's getting boring. I need to introduce something. I need to introduce some action. And dialogue is always some action. So if you if you have a half a page of something uh, describing something, you need to come up with some kind of action. And dialogue is always a good uh, possibility. So I just naturally, I read it out loud very often. And when you read it loud, you hear yourself. Is it getting boring? Is it getting monotonous the way you read it? And if it sounds just a little monotonous, you can assume that the kids were very monotonous because adults consider it a little. uh, Kids will always feel it stronger in that way. So the moment I feel, oh, it sounds monotonous, I introduce dialogue in it. Got it. So it's very innate. And like you said, you're kind of going for the feeling and how exactly. you're reacting to it, your little child brain, because we all have a child exactly. brain, don't we? <laughs> we do, yeah, we do, yeah. Yes, yeah, we yeah. do, we do. And it's important to keep that alive because uh, if you want to keep up writing middle grade and young adults, and um, at some point your kids, many, you know, many uh, parents write while the kids are still young. But if you want to keep writing, these kids, your kids will grow up. They will be 18 or 20 at some point. And then suddenly you don't have any subjects, anything to to work from anymore because your kids do not provide these information anymore because they're older. So you need to resort to your inner kid or to your own childhood in order to come up with these ideas again and then talk to kids. You know, this will help you to maintain this when your kids have grown up. Oh, my gosh, you must have be a fly on my wall for the last few years. That is exactly what's happened, like literally. <laughs> it, it, and it I has, feel huh? like I can't write as fast or maybe mm-hmm. what's happening is I'm not trusting myself because mm-hmm. normally I would check in with them and they would give me mm-hmm. all the feedback. No, no, oh, my gosh, yes, great. Exactly. Oh, I'm snoring. All the bits, mm-hmm. and then they mm-hmm. stopped. And I think it was, I think it was Evie Everyday Witch book number three uh, was yes. the very first book I wrote without mm-hmm. having them critique it, and I was mm-hmm. terrified. <laughs> I remember, and I and actually, Oops. I I did the exact opposite thing. I went wild, yeah. like that. You uh, read book one, it's sort of like la 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 la. Everything's book two, yes, so uh, makes it book three, mate. It went off plot. It just went. <laughs> crazy and I thought oh (laughs) my goodness if they knew I did this they would get they would be mad but they they were too old now to read it so off I went and published it thinking I am Uh gone that is the end of my career (laughs) right and eventually my daughter did read it as a favor to me and and she said she's a bit older but she said that was my favorite of all of them Maybe you can uh, write nice. without us. Maybe you can write without us. <laughs> Very nice. So, Very so this nice. is yeah. really wise what you say, yes, that this yeah, is what yeah. happens to a lot yes. of authors. Yes. But, yes. but, Mark, uh-huh. I have yes. not, I don't know how to overcome this because people say, get other kids to give feedback. How? Where? Where did we find these other kids? How do you get feedback? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm lucky that I have a lot of kids in you know my my friends have kids and uh, all around there are some um but also you can get um when you go to readings you know go to schools you know and do some readings i did a reading before corona last time because corona stopped everything I did a reading it was really helpful you know for middle grade and it was also interesting because the teacher wanted me to read the middle grade book the magora book the first one she wanted me to read it not only to the maid, but she wanted to read it to the 15 year olds. And I said, no, I wouldn't want to do that, you know? And she said, no, 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 do this. They love it. And I was like, I did it. And I could tell in the class they were losing interest and everything. 
they have other things to do, you know, at 15, 16. So um, you could see they lost interest. And since this was in a German school, I was reading it in German uh, at the time. So I was, um, I was resorting to something else. I said, okay, obviously you guys seem bored. Why don't I read the whole story in English? Because I have it in English and in German. And at 15, their English is not that good. So I started reading the whole thing in English, and suddenly there was they were, you know, fixed. They had to listen. They didn't understand everything. And suddenly I got all the attention back. <laughs> so, but that tells you, you know, that certain stories and the way they are written, you can have a middle grade book, you know, be interested, interesting for 15, 16 year olds. You know, this is a different level. You know, that's why I also wrote The Language Thieves, my last book, which was more for young adult, um, which was uh, which wouldn't appeal so much to the middle grade. You, know? you really have to look at the subjects. You have to look at the wording, also the length, if it is young adult or middle grade. So, um, so otherwise, I would not suggest, you know, saying like, oh, my book is written for all ages. That's what many uh, first time authors uh, make, uh, mistakes uh, may, they make is that they say, oh, my book is for all ages because they want to have everybody read it. But even if you want them to read it, you know, if, if you want everybody to read it from a child to an adult, it won't happen. They won't uh, read it. So you better research, see where your book fits, and then, you know, clearly uh, go for this age group. Yeah, really sound advice. I do see people doing this. They will say, like, for, for middle grade and young adult, and I'm like, hold on. Mm -hmm. They are such mm -hmm. different, you know, groups mm -hmm. of people. Right. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're not going to read the same sort of things, right. you know. No, um, no. And I read, I read somewhere that in middle grade, children tend to sort of come home, even if they come home to themselves or to, you know, some mm. place, whereas in young adult, they often sort of are going out into the world and getting away from home, if that makes sense, to, <laughs> to have their adventure or whatever's happening in life. So I thought that was quite a nice description of the two. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And different. you have also, in, in young adult, you can address complete different subjects, you know, mm. like uh, the whole, um, you know, love theme and, and violence and everything. Um, yeah, 16, 17-year-olds are used to that. But for middle grade, um, of course, a lot of them do this now. They address these subjects, but um, a lot of publishers wouldn't publish these. You know, if you start, you know, talking about love and sex and and crime and everything in in middle grade, um, they wouldn't address this. Uh, they wouldn't publish it. And a lot of the libraries and bookstores would not take these books because it's not geared to middle grade. And no matter if you like it or not. This is the way it is. And if you write a book and then address these subjects in middle grade and say, like, I do it the way I do, oh, you can do it. But then your book will be there on the stack uh, somewhere on Amazon and nobody will even buy it or, you know, um, uh, look at it. So it's better to really stick to what the rules are. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. If you want to make sales, if you don't, exactly. then do whatever you like. Oh, yeah, <laughs> do whatever you like. Yeah, I mean, you <laughs> then you can write whatever you want and publish it and have it for your own kids or give it to your grandma or whatever. That's that's a complete different story. But if you want to have a career or a success in this field, um, you have to stick to the rules, you know, and you will never. Uh, be able to, you know, completely revolutionize and change the way the publishing industry is working. So if you want to have a success, stick with it. If you don't and want to do your own thing and, and, and uh, rebel, do it, but don't expect uh, that millions of people will read your book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, because ultimately what they, what they look at is the sort of the psychological age of readers, you know, like we're, exactly. we're psychologically yes. and developmentally, yes, they're yes. at, at we're all at at certain ages. Like right. I can't remember exactly. what book I read it in, but it was something like 
um, that, you know, children at that particular age group, they love wonder, magic and wonder, they're, and yes. they're really geared to that. But then when they mm -hmm. get to sort of teenage years, higher teenage years, mm -hmm. the girls veer off into a bit of romance and the boys veer mm -hmm. off into yes. like more adventure type or, you know, yes, kind of. adventure uh, or yeah. dystopia and this kind of thing. Yeah. Right, right. And then that continues on. Like it actually described the psychological right, processes right. of readers, you know, males and females. sort of match what age and stage they're at it's really quite fascinating actually so yes, yeah, yeah. so yeah you've got to keep that in mind and yes and i think especially i mean considering male and female um books uh there are uh, these things you know i mean a lot of people say nowadays oh no it's all gender neutral and everything but no i mean there is it's a fact that uh girls read more uh romance novels Partly any any of the boys will, you know, and you can change what want whatever you want. Um, it's not going to change it, you know. I mean, a boy would never. I mean, there are some boys, but the majority of the boys won't read that, you know. So um, yes, you can write a book, a romance novel geared to boys, but don't expect to have that success. You will. There will always be a niche for everything. Yeah. Of course, but uh, the majority will not go for that. And um, if you want to address both genders, then you have to find a subject that is interesting to both. You know, mm -hmm. you won't you won't be able to write a. I mean, if you write a novel about makeup and doing hair and everything, you won't get the boys' attention. Same thing, you know. If you get the boys and they are talking about I don't know soccer or something, you know. There will be some girls really interested, you know, but um, the majority will go more for the romance. And uh, yeah, if you want to write for a niche, that's fine. But um, you always have to see wh which direction you want to take. And this is also where you're going to end up then, basically. You end up either in a niche or you end up, uh, yeah, in, in a big, broader, with a big, broader audience. Right. And yeah, so yeah. like, for example, if we take Harry Potter again, you know, she perfectly, I mean, she used a male hero still. She did a lot of action and everything, but she introduced also these love things and everything. So she geared, you know, to both genders, obviously. Um, and she had male and female characters. So, um, yeah, um, it was geared to both. Mm -hmm. um, so you always have to choose um, which direction you want to take. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. You just got to have a target market in in mind yes. uh, and not yes. be disappointed if, like you said, mm -hmm. that's, if that's a niche group, you still might have fantastic sales with that niche group, but you won't necessarily mm -hmm. hit the broader population. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a, makes a lot of sense, makes a lot of sense. So yes, yes. you illustrated The Chocolate Clouds, which was amazing yes. because, you know, to get a middle grade book that's so beautifully 
illustrated yes. is mm -hmm. you know it's not very common <laughs> actually no so no. what made you decide that you were going to also do illustrations um it was the well usually picture books are the ones that are being uh, illustrated fully and middle grade they always say kids do not want to have at that age pictures anymore they find it childish that was always what uh they were saying you just have like a little spot illustration at the beginning of the chapter and so on so that was for a lot many years they were saying this all the time oh no kids don't want this don't want this now i realized in the past 10 years that this has changed when I was talking to kids and so on, I realized, you know, they were saying, oh, no, no, pictures are fine. Pictures are fine. They didn't find it childish anymore. They find it helpful, you know. And I think it might come also through um, through the new generation of adults because the, the adults changed also from, like, you know, the generation that were in the 50s and 60s. They considered cartoons and so on childish. Now, those who have grown up with cartoons, they have become adult and they have they have their kids on their own now. So they do not consider pictures to be childish anymore in a book. So I think that's what was passed on to the children, that suddenly ch pictures in a book are not considered childish anymore, but more like supportive, interesting, beautiful. You know? So when I realized that this was the case, that a lot of children like illustrations and don't uh, see it as a as an obstacle to read the book then i thought like okay it's time maybe to do a middle grade novel that is fully illustrated not just has like little illustrations and then i i noticed that many middle grade books do not have that i mm. i don't know many um i researched a lot about this i talked also some to people in the in the publishing industry uh, with the big publishers and they said this doesn't have anything to do with that um with the fact that uh we don't want them or we uh can't put them in this is just a purely financial issue the big publishers can't afford it because my book has 150 illustrations in there it's all black and white pencil drawings um to pay for that pay an illustrator to do that uh they would have to go into the tens tens of thousands to pay that uh because i mean i worked three years basically on these illustrations to get it done um a regular publisher cannot afford that basically also the big publishers are not willing to put that money in especially uh, because nowadays nothing sells like harry potter you know um uh, so so the the amount they are getting back from their investment uh the roi basically is very low and that's why they don't do this so i thought like okay i can illustrate that's my job uh i can write why not offer um the people something you can't get and that's how i started it and did it then <laughs> so you're like the unicorn you can write and you can draw it's so unfair <laughs> yeah it's so yeah, unfair it's, oh, it's, it's yeah cheating, it's, it's mark it's cheating uh, i'm sorry i know sorry. i have a way of telling people always on this show that they're okay, cheating okay, because they okay, are okay, okay. but it's good cheating i'm, okay. I'm just <laughs> jealous i'm jealous and i'm i'm actually like uh, learning how to draw and uh what advice good. would you That's give perfect. to any any crazy people out there who are writing and <laughs> learning how to draw because of course you know uh, you are a world-renowned artist and you've uh, been drawing for a lot of years but what do you think does it take like a really long time you know, should you give yourself years to get good at I, it what are you what are I, you I really have to disappoint you because I have to say that illustrating and painting is much harder to learn, I think, than writing because um, you need much more time, I think. You need much more time than with writing. If you invest like a few years in writing, you can learn the basics very quickly. You can express yourself um fast if you're picking up the advice of the professionals um it is a way 
everybody knows how to write, you know, already, while most people do not know how to illustrate. You know, they do like little, you know, stick figures. Stick figures <laughs> um, <yes. laughs> exactly. So, um, so I think uh, illustrating takes um, so much time because there are so many different styles. That you have created and each styles requires a different technique that you need to learn and um and if you do like with this book i like i did like read redid a lot of illustrations i i uh, started um the first illustration of uh, of the chapter i read it three times until i got to the one that i really uh, thought was beautiful and which uh, worked and you need to also develop the eye that's also very important so paying detail to every uh, everything to really uh, see the color differences in this case not it's black and white but um, in paintings and uh, this takes in my opinion much longer than writing and that's why I mean, you of course, everybody can improve with painting and illustrating. You just need to invest a lot of time in there, you know, and and everybody can get to a level that it is really nice and really professional, but it takes longer, you know. Mm -hmm. And and you see this a lot now with self publishers that a lot of them use. Um, uh, say, oh, I can do that myself, you know, and then you see it in the cover that it is not really professionally done, you know? And, uh, and this really takes away from your book, your story, because uh, let's face it, uh, even though they say, don't judge a book by its cover, that's the first thing you see when you touch a book. And if you don't like the cover, a lot of people go like, oh no, this looks unprofessional, then the writing must be unprofessional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and this kind of like has a, a trigger effect, I think. You know, so you don't want to go down that lane because um, if you do it yourself and you are not really hundred percent sure that you can do it really well, and it is professional, uh, it will only hurt your book because so many great authors, you know, uh, might lose only because they don't want to do uh, invest maybe in a cover or think they can do it themselves you know so yeah but you have done all your own covers haven't you because you can actually draw have, and yes, paint yeah, yes yes, yes. Yeah, yeah i i i've done done them all myself i had a lot i it took me like i didn't study graphic design you know i did uh, studied illustration so i had a hard time with the fonts and, and text so it took me like 10 years to really uh, work with text and and uh, words that I could finally also put that into my illustration without feeling oh it's not that professional you know but I remember like designing the 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 logo of the Gora series the first one I think I spent like seven months going back and forth and forth back and forth before I decided to take that that logo that I have now because I wasn't sure, I was not a hundred percent clear on how to use fonts, um, and it took a long time, and it really needed ten years uh, to really figure it out. Then, so, but now, yes, I do it all myself. Yeah, I think fonts is a big one. Like I'll actually notice now, uh, like some authors who are self-published will invest in really good artwork and I'll think, oh, yeah, that artwork's good, and then I can tell it's self-published because of the font. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know, where did they get that? I don't know what it is that makes a yes. font look professional or not professional, exactly. but there yes, is exactly. definitely something. Like even mm -hmm. a yes. quite goodish font can look terrible mm -hmm. on the front cover exactly. of a book. Yes. Like it, So yes. typography is critical and is its yes. own thing. Like you said, 10 years to get good exactly, at the typography. Yeah. I, I believe you. Yes. Typography is yes, big. Yeah. So yeah, I, I caution you, dear listener, do not mm -hmm. go cheap on your typography 
I hope Excellent. and pray that my typography yes, is actually yes, yeah, at a yeah, decent standard. Yeah. I it's think it's very is. nice. Yeah, I think yes, it is. It's, it's nice. like yes, it's yes, not yes, like probably. it hasn't got that hand drawn effect, which is another beautiful nope. level yes, of yes. middle grade, hundred yes. percent. But it's still professional enough, and some aren't. Some look like they've come off the computer or off Canva. Don't yes, do that. Enough. You can. Don't you just. That. I exactly. just. You just go on Amazon exactly. and you have a look, and yeah. I think great artwork. Exactly. Why did you do that font? <laughs> you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um... Exactly. The the only problem is that I mean, a lot of covers uh, and illustrations are expensive, of and course. I understand that a lot of self publishers just don't have um, the money to really invest in that. So in that case, I really, if you have to do it yourself, I would suggest. Take some of the um, traditional published books, look at the fonts there, you know, look what they did and kind of copy them basically, you know, do something similar, not 100% copy them, mm -hmm. you know, but stay in that. I mean, you can use the same font they are using, you know, uh, it's not, it's not forbidden or anything, you know, try to do the layout they, the way they do it, you know. And then you are sure that at least you're trying to, um, you have a more professional look if you can't afford hiring people for that. So I think that is the best thing. And that's what I did for the many years before I really made a living of my art. I always looked at the professionals and I tried to copy that and copy that and copy that until I developed a sense for this. You know, it's a lot of time, but of course, if you, don't have money, you know, you invest the time to learn it yourself. Yeah, spot on. Really great advice. That's right. Yeah, copy or mimic others until you get a feel for that and give yourself yes, yeah. time, right? You need time. money or time, very, one or the other. Exactly. Yeah, both, you're very, very, very fortunate. Very lucky, lifetime. yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Exactly, yes. And time is very essential, I think, because a lot of people just want to rush through something and say, oh, I want to publish this book, and, and they just go quick, 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 and then it turns out this way. You know, I rather take my time. And so I know that this new book that I just um, finished, uh, it is done basically, it's edited, but until it's going to be published, it's going to be two years because I want to illustrate it, I can look at it and so on. It's not going to be, it's not going to come out next week, you know? So i uh, rather take my time, have a very good quality, a very good standard, and then just publish a book every two or three years. Right. So again, people have to decide which way they go, right? Because in, in independent publishing, uh, there, mm -hmm. some people love speed and kind yes. of less quality and they still make a lot of money this way. And that's the yes. approach they've consciously chosen to do. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yes. So Which is but perfect I, line, yeah. somebody told me this, um, that you can't have all three. You can't have uh, time... Uh, quality and cost you have to give up on one of them so you know if it's if it's cheap then you can you know get get it done it'll take longer right yes. and um yes. and uh, you know the the you can have the okay quality sometimes i think yes, yes but you know yes. like if it's if yes. you take you know if you want it fast you're gonna yes, have yeah. to pay more <laughs> for that does that make sense you can't have them all yeah, you have yeah. to give up one but, or the other yeah i mean you can see that even with the traditional publishers i mean once a book is done and the the uh the the author sends in the book to the publisher from that point on it usually takes one to two years with a big publisher until it is being published and there are they have the money there is like 30 people working for them, still they need a year or two years almost to get it published. So that tells you something about how much time is being invested, how much uh, effort and how much, uh, uh, yeah, how, how much quality they want to have. So yeah, it, it just takes time, you know, and of course, if you want to do it fast and quick and everything, which is perfectly fine, but then of course you have to lower the standard uh, a bit because you don't have the time to do all this and that's perfectly natural yeah makes a lot of sense so let's talk if it's okay about writing a series how is that different than writing 
a standalone? And how did you approach that? Did you actually like, you know, sort of plan it all out or did it organically yes. kind of? How did you do it? Yes. I did. I planned it all out. And that's why it took so long until I got the first book published. Because uh, it depends on, first of all, it depends on what kind of series you write. Do you write a series which is like um whole story, like Harry Potter, for example. It starts with one book and ends with the last one. And it is a whole story that resolves issues the second book resolves issue from the first, the fifth, from the third, and so on. This is one story, which is basically a story where each book is based on each other. Or do you write a series, which is like the same character, the same setting, or the same feel, but every book is a close story, and it doesn't relate to the third or the fourth one. It's just basically the characters, and these are. Um, yeah, and th these are the same characters. So if you write the latter, uh, then I don't think it is much different to writing a standalone because you have a complete story which needs to be uh, closed within. It has to be, um, it has to be uh, conclusive. It has to be clear and has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So you don't have to worry about uh, thinking about the third book. While the first part, which is like the Harry Potter or my Megora series, um, you need to have a plan because otherwise you will fall short on certain issues that you have introduced. And then the reader will go like, wait a second, we're now in the sixth book, it's over. You never resolved that issue in the third book, you know, or, oh, wait a second, in the second book, that character had blue eyes. Now he has green eyes, you know, <laughs> or things like this. It happens all the time with these books because there are so many things you need to, you know, remember and keep track of. So that's why this type of series is much more difficult to write than uh, the one that is close. Um, with this one, I think you need to have a clear plot and you need to have a... a, a, a a list of your characters. You need to to keep them uh, consistent, basically. Um, and I had like a huge plan, which was like three by three meters, and I, it was written in tiny little letters, you know, and like arrows going <laughs> this way and that way and all over the place, so that I would miss, you know, certain things. And um, I didn't expect it to go, get so complicated in the end that it all matches and everything. Um, I just realized after the second book what I got myself into. So it was my the first book was my it was my debut uh, de debut uh, novel, and I was uh, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, I just got to write it. And then I realized after the second one, no, no, no. I got myself into big trouble here to resolve all these issues, you know? So that's why it took me so long. And I didn't want to publish the first one, which was lucky that I didn't. Because after the sixth book, I had to go back to the first one and change things because some things didn't match. Um, if you had published, you know, each one right away, you would have been stuck with that. And you would have found, ha had to find other solutions. Clearly, I didn't have to do this because I read the whole series then at the end and then publish the first book when it's done you know so um in that respect yes you need a big plan you need plot you need an outline to really uh solve all these issues yes but you can still go back and change the first book even if you have released it that is the magic of self-publishing yes the that children that true. already read it will be like what is happening yes. here but yeah, it, it's true. not the end of the world. Yes. And I, I yes. say that mostly for myself because I am yes. now writing book three of The Magicians and exactly yes. what you uh, just said happened. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> what What was I thinking when I wrote book one yes. and two? Yes. Like we've now yes. arrived at yes. book yes. three yes. and there's like, mm -hmm. I think there's going to be like five villains because some of them are coming from the past, uh -huh. all arriving yes. in the current time frame. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. What? What? Yes. What? So, and I get yes. fan mail. I do. When is this book yes. coming? And I'm like, guys, yes. guys, oh, guys, I don't have a magic wand. I can't just go boom and write it. 
It's actually yes. I made a mess. I'm now trying to fix mm -hmm. the mess. Mm -hmm. This is a legitimate thing. So this is really, and really valid advice. Do the work for four. Before, before yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see that Probably. with like uh, also Game of Thrones. It's a, big, a, big, a good example. I mean, he has so many characters. I don't know how he can even keep track of that. And uh, you can tell how long it takes him for the next book to come out. Um, he he gotten himself also into big trouble to resolve all that. You know, of course, if you only have like you know a hundred readers, they might not discover it. But like he has millions, there will be someone will find that problem. You know, and then you are in trouble. You know, so uh, yeah. But with self publishing, at least you go back and change it. You know, but um, the book sold. They will be out there, and then someone will run into those, you know, and then they will find the mistake, and then you go like, "Wait a second, no, I didn't read that." <laughs> well, a friend read that, and then you have these issues, you know, these changes, and they go like, "Yeah, but this must have been the first issue, uh, the first um, uh, publication." <laughs> then the other one goes like, "No, I have the third one," you know, and then goes back and forth. Oh, so, so gosh. really, yeah, do the work before. <laughs> Well, yeah. fingers crossed. I mean, I I just want to prove to myself that I can pull this off, even and if you can. it you yeah, know, I'm it sure gives you me will. a nervous breakdown yeah. in the process. But you I will <laughs> do this. Uh, what you was will really, be able to pull it. Really down. funny was a series called Alfie Bloom and something or other, uh -huh. and it was a trad uh -huh. published book, and you know, uh -huh. really good, loved it. Then book, bought book two. Partway through the book, Alfie, the main character, his name suddenly changed. Oh, like it oh. was like. Frank. Oh, that is weird. And I was like, huh? Hold on. Hold that on. It's very strange. Two chapters. It was a different name. And then it went back to Alfie. And I thought, how did this get that, past the editors or the yes. proofreaders or the. But, yeah. but it is interesting because you get a glimpse into what the author did before, it was probably the name he right. used before using Alfie. So for a funny? writer, it's interesting to see that. For readers, like, uh, I'm getting confused on what's happening. <laughs> I know. It was really funny. So, you know, these things, right, you know, right. do happen. It is a process, isn't it? And it's a learning journey and we learn it and is, get better yes. and better and better. And that's, you know, how it exactly. goes. Exactly. Well, you exactly. love to translate yeah. your books, which is incredible. So talk to me. <laughs> and you don't necessarily get, you know, uh, foreign rights translation. You organize the translation. Yes. Yes, 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 actually, here you, here you go. All these are the translations from Norwegian, Swedish, uh, Danish, Dutch, Italian, Brazilian, Portuguese, Brazilian. I'm working right now on the French version, German, of course, because that's also my native language. And um, so, yeah, I, I'm working also on the Japanese version. Um, Spanish was the Magoras. It was uh, the first one was published in Spanish and uh, Mandarin Chinese. So um, yes, I I I I I love languages. I've been studying many languages for many years, and um, which makes it much easier for me to do these translations because I find these translators myself. Um, I find uh, sometimes. Re ones that are have translated many books already others um, have done it for the first time uh i really it was a coincidence actually that i got so many which is because i put the chocolate clouds out on a platform and i said okay listen i can't afford as a publisher to have these translations and pay like thousands of euros you know or dollars um I can't afford that. So, um, so I, all I can offer you is have like a full page in the book then where it tells, I mean, everything about you with a picture, everything. You're going to be on the cover of the book, you know. So if you take, for example, here, Le Nuvole di Chocolate, which is the Italian one, you have her name here. Uh, Martina, you know, so I, uh, that's what I offered them, you know, and um, I said, if anybody is interested, please give me a shout. And I was, I was stunned. I couldn't believe it. I got like 80 offers. I mean, from all different kinds of languages, you know, even like exotic languages like Vietnamese or some Indian language and Turkish and so on. Um, 
But unfortunately, because I'm publishing through Amazon, um, many of these languages are not supported. So I, I had to pick the ones that were supported, which are the Scandinavian languages, um, Swedish, Norwegian, Danish that I picked. Um, then there was Dutch, uh, Italian. Italian, Brazilian, uh, Portuguese, European Portuguese. And um, so I I made a deal with them and then I went through, the, uh, they translated it. I can't, of course, judge good the translation is. The Scandinavian languages, I do understand roughly what it's about because they are very similar with uh, German and English and so on, with all the languages I know, I can go through the text and I understand roughly what it's about. So I could always, when I did the design, I could always read the text and know where I have to insert the picture because I understood what was going on. Um, with Italian, it was the same thing. I speak, uh, uh, speak and write uh, Spanish, so I could find a connection with that. Brazilian uh, is the same with the Spanish similarity. So I didn't have a problem, you know, setting these up. Um, uh, now French is coming up next, which was uh, translated uh, actually by my mother. My mother and her teacher She's been studying for many, many years French, uh, ever since she was 20 years old. So tens of years she studied. Uh, and they decided they want to translate it. So uh, she worked with her teacher and they translated it. So I'm going to look for a copy editor now in French who's going to read and see what she messed up there. <laughs> but um, but so French is coming up then too. And then Japanese is being edited right now, which is going to be... Uh, would be more difficult to set up, but luckily I studied Japanese. I lived in Japan for a year, so I can read it. It uh, not the characters; they are too complicated. But I will be able to set it up myself and not be completely left with the writing. Yeah, so, so that's why I have now ten languages. You know, which is really nice to have these in different languages. And they've been doing well, I have to say, because they're going, you know, they're always in the top 100s on Amazon in their in their language. There is not a big market, I would say, but it is, um, it's just a passion of mine to have it in these languages, you know. I wish there was Greek, but unfortunately, <laughs> Greek is not supported. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, it is not supported. You're right, you're right. Yeah. It's, but it's not, um. Yeah. Yeah. It's still a lot of good languages that are supported, so it's it's incredible. Sure, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And to and for you to actually, you know, invest to bring it out in all the different languages, it's it's quite it's amazing. Actually, it's really amazing. It's enjoyable. It's really enjoyable because uh, this way, I'm also learning how similar the European languages are. You know, because you can always, when you know like three or four of them, you can always pull something from one language to another and then understand roughly what it's about. You know, I had a translator at first for Finnish. Um, unfortunately, that didn't go out um, because she was really busy. Um, that would have been a different issue because Finnish is not related to all the European languages. Uh, and I would never have understood a single word. So, <laughs> so that would have been really difficult to set that one up. But yeah, but luckily, you know, with Chinese and, and Japanese, I know enough of the language to do it myself. But with if it was um, Arab or Turkish, I would be completely lost also. <laughs> well, the fact that you know so many languages are, are such a talented artist, a talented writer, and you've been doing these things for a lot of years, like, wow, that's like a lot yeah. of things to master in one lifetime already and you're young still <laughs> like what are you going to do next I, <laughs> <laughs> well actually i'm working right now on 3d modeling uh 3d modeling and uh animation because i would love to you know get like caratina uh to make her an animation character and make her move around and have little videos and so on so i am taking classes now in 3D animation to understand Blender, um, and um, it's coming along slowly, but you just need to take the time. <laughs> That's incredible, and I love that. It's like you're really passionate about your characters and yes. bringing them to life. So, you know, you really do believe in your own stories and your own characters. Yes. 
Yes, and and uh, and I think characters are also the key to children's books, because um, if the characters are not mm, pleasant and and the kids won't like them, uh, the whole story won't uh, save the book. You know, so you need to have characters that are also not boring. You know, there are a lot of books I read sometimes where. The, the 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 story is fine but then the characters are so boring you know they don't have any edges or anything and yes that is true that there are a lot of people in this world that don't have edges and and are not are boring in a way you know but um this is not what uh readers want to read about you know and um you want to have uh, a character that has a problem and is fighting for it to solve the problem. And uh, that is also one of the major things that I see very often in uh, self-published books, that the, the character is just follows the plot line and is just being swept along. While you need to see the character really take action and really do something to solve the issue that the character is faced with and uh if if the character is not doing anything and is just being affected by the things around him or her then the reader will not um be emotionally involved with that character so that's why it's very important to pay attention to the characters also great advice really great advice all right, well, last area of question is mm -hmm. awards. You win yes. so many awards. Tell <laughs> me, how do you find them? Like, what awards? <laughs> like, do you go on an award hunt? Like, what are the, are the amazing <laughs> awards? I, at one point, I thought <laughs> I was going to enter everything you enter after you enter yeah. it. And I think I did it like three <laughs> times, and then I had award burnout. So, you know, how do you maintain such a level of enthusiasm for awards and how do you find oh. them? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, we've frozen a bit. I'll just wait for that. You're sorry. And your oh, picture right. is frozen and I can't hear. You're back okay. now. Okay, yeah. there you are. Did you okay. hear the question? Did you hear the question? <laughs> no, uh, just the beginning about the awards and then it ah, yeah, well, So <laughs> I up. said, um, you know, like, ha and, you know, you, you find the best awards and you don't get award burnout. You actually persist with entering a variety of them. Uh, so how do you find them and how do you make decisions around that? Well, uh, if you are self-published, you only have a limited amount of awards that you can enter because the famous big awards they are only uh for the traditional published books so you are not even allowed to enter so you have to look at the awards that are for self-publishers and there are a lot um there is um there are a lot that are also scam um there are some that have been around for a long time already now in terms of self-publishing um, um, times. Um, so I think those that have been around for such a long time, even though some places, or some authors do not consider them to be so legitimate or so, you know, um, I think if they have been around for 20 years, you know, they have a certain standing which is like reader's favorite which is the biggest i think then there is the ippy award you know they are commercially commercially uh, um uh, um um they are commercial in a in in um in a way that they make a profit and so on if you're a company you know you need to make a profit in order to survive so you can't blame these companies for it but if they have been around so long I would say, okay, then they have a certain um, standing, you know, and they are quite important and they do not uh, award uh, anybody this award, you know, after so many years. Uh, there are others that have around not that long, 
I there is uh, the alliance of authors that makes a list basically of which ones are good, which ones are not good. I always uh, check there. There is, for example, the Wish Elf Award, which I like to uh, uh, mention. You also won that <laughs> with uh, Philly Lane. And uh, I think that is a wonderful award in the UK. And uh, it because you um, get the feedback off the children or off the readers. And um, it's not basically only the award that you get, but you get from real readers, you get a feedback. And for kids, that is really important because these kids will write something about it. If your book is not good, you know, kids can be harsh. So you have to be prepared that they say, oh, it really sucked, you know? <laughs> so, um, if, but if you're lucky, you know, and, and uh, in my case, they, they, they um, just wrote wonderful things and got the um, gold medal in that award. And I was really happy uh, about it because all the kids, the comments were beautiful. They loved it. They loved the illustrations also. That was really good to hear that it did work, that putting into a middle grade book illustrations. And um, so that was one award that I really enjoyed. Um, I also got uh, the Dragon, uh, Royal Dragonfly Award, which is a, an American um, award which surprised me really a lot because it had many, many categories and adult categories, nonfiction, everything. And they award from all of these a grand prize in the end. And I read the grand prize, which really dazzled me because I was surprised that a middle grade novel can compete with like crime, romance for adults, wow. how to do books, anything, you know. So I was really surprised that 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 it uh that it worked you know and it's a it's a magazine uh monster inc i think is the name and uh, the lady who runs it does a beautiful job you know she's really nice and it is um so it's also really nice award i think um uh there are others uh i i got like the spa award which was also like the um the um, Royal Dragonfly Award that they award a grand, grand prize and the middle grade won against all these. Gosh, um, good you this was really, Yeah, this was really helpful because they give you a, um, a, a marketing package. So if you're not good at marketing, like most authors are, you are, I'm not, <laughs> but um, many authors are not. And they kind of like help you uh, spe uh, specify categories, then they help you, you know, uh, get views and so on. So that was really helpful uh, just by getting their, uh, their, uh, the work basically. Um, other, other awards, you just get like a mention, you know, in on on their website, and you never hear from them again. So for me, it was good to try all these out to see which one is most effective and which ones I wouldn't enter anymore. You know, the Wishing Shelf Award I would definitely again, the Dragonfly Award I would probably also because I felt there was something coming from them. You know, it was also that um, you have a feedback. Others. You don't even get an email, you know, they go like, you know, whatever, you know, so you can see that these are that, uh, excuse me, that these are then geared just um, to make money. You know? So you have to look at uh, which ones are better and which ones are not. And I learned it basically by trying them out. And that's why I get so many awards because I tried them. I think I tried all of them out, you know, and that's good now, I think 25 or six awards. So. Um, I'm running out of words that I can en <laughs> enter. <laughs> well, they'll see your name and they'll be like, oh, Mike's got a new book. <laughs> Yay. No one's going to win that year. Okay, don't enter your book in a competition in the same year that Mark enters his book in the same <laughs> category because you will not win. So don't do that. Wait till he's out and then you put yours in. <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't let you know who entered. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna email you personally, Mark. Are you entering any of your books this year, Mark? <laughs> Dragonfly Book Awards. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you just don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm, 
I I entered the splendid secrets that you hold the book that you have into mm-hmm. the yes, uh, this one here. That one that piece, <laughs> everybody's flashing it up into the reader's favorite, yes. and um, <laughs> I think it only came in as a finalist, maybe. So it was like coming fifth. So it was. Oh, okay. I think that okay. they got gold, silver, whatever, and finalist. But okay, a particular country who I'm not allowed yet to say. Uh, uh-huh. A particular country, their biggest publishing house that translated Harry Potter, actually uh-huh. contacted me with a foreign rights deal because they saw it on that. So you just oh, don't know where these things wonderful. lead. Yes, and you know, yes. It's, yes, gold is good, but we can't all be uh-huh. Mark uh-huh. Remus, right? <laughs> and um, you know, but it, you just don't know. Even if it places somewhere and it's getting the exposure, uh-huh. and you know, the book. Uh-huh. Uh, reader's favorite has it up on their website the whole time mm-hmm. and yes, for many yes. years to come. So, you know, it's still getting a kind of shout out. And you just don't know what could come from it. So, so yes, yeah, enter exactly. you never the know. book awards. Yeah. 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 Well, I also like because the awards had like also uh, a publishing house in the big publishing house in the Czech Republic contact me back then because of reader's favorite. They are yeah. there. Um, and they published uh, Harry Potter in the Czech Republic, and they were interested in Megora back then. Unfortunately, it was a big process in these publishing houses. There were like 10 editors, uh, and each editor had to submit one middle grade book. From oh, all man. of these, the board of direct elected one. <gasps> so this one editor picked my book to, to get it into the, uh, in there. But there were nine other editors who made it also a middle grade book. And then they didn't pick mine from those 10. That, oh, no, <laughs> but, but so close. Is, yeah, so very close, close, yeah. And, and this is what happens, you know, with these awards, because the publishers, the big publishers, they look at these awards. I mean, not the tiny little ones that are coming up and disappearing again. So, But these, these standard ones, like Reader fa- Reader's Favorite or it be or Dragonfly Award, they they look at it. And um I think also in the UK the Wishing Shelf Award is getting a better and better reputation because it's all the authors love it, you know. And I think this is also a thing that where publishers are gonna look at more mm. often. Yeah. Especially because as you say, the kids are the readers of that one. And uh exactly. and they are they're so funny. I think when I got one of my reviews back they said, this author reminds me of Enid Blyton and Roald Dahl. And I was like, home run. They're my two, <laughs> you know, my two childhood authors. But then the next line was like, oh, perhaps not as funny as Roald Dahl. <laughs> and I thought, okay, okay, I can still improve mm-hmm. on that. <laughs> but they just tell it as yeah. it is and it's fantastic. They, they do. Know? Yeah, it's fantastic. And it really is a good back that you get. And and it's also interesting because uh, the guy who runs that award, he always keeps saying also, don't preach. All these books that preach in middle grade, they never make it to the top. And it, it and the kids write it then, you know, and there have been some harsh remarks by the kids. Some authors don't like it, but this is what we're doing if you deal with kids, you know. Adults are more selective in their words, how they um, critique something, but kids won't. So be prepared, you know, and don't <laughs> lash out on 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 the on the guy who who runs the award, you know. Very true, very true. Well, thank you so much. You've given so much of your time and expertise today. I loved having you on the show. All the links to Mark will be in the show notes, so look out for those, everybody. And hopefully, if I remember, I also put I will also put the link to the awards list that you mentioned from Uh, the mm -hmm. uh, Alliance of Independent Authors. So I'll yes, put that in there yeah. as well. So you can all go and enter the awards. Don't enter the same year I enter, all right, because I want to win <laughs> something for once. I deserve gold, finally. <laughs> so my approach yeah. is to kill the competition or just, like, bribe them to not enter in the same year that I enter. That's my approach, not Mark's approach. Mark actually writes an excellent book. <laughs> so you decide <laughs> which approach you, you want to take. And, um, and go with that. But thanks again so much, Mark. You've been an absolute wonderful guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful being with you. Did you find?
find that interview valuable? Great! Now be an awesome human and go and leave a review because it helps the podcast out so much. Want to read the show notes? Check out thechildrensbookauthorpodcast.com. Want to find out more about me, Eleanor Page? Find me at eleanorpage.com or come and say hello on social at Eleanor Page Books. Until next time, keep writing and keep learning.